Well, good morning, everybody. How lovely it is to see you in real life, in person, and not on a screen. Welcome to the 2022 conference. My name is Chris Padovani. I'm the Acting Director of Fisheries Management, and I'll be your MC for the day. I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Yorta Yorta people, and then pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Really, I've lost my little bell thing here to, uh, for any speakers that are talking too long. I've got a little thing here just to ring the bell. We'll fix that a bit later on. Just wanted to touch base on a few little housekeeping notes at the moment. Uh, if you need to go to the bathrooms, they're just through the doors here, through to the left, or you can take the scenic route if you prefer. Uh, we do have goodie bags for you this year. Unfortunately, we're not handing them out until morning tea time, but you'll get those a little bit later on, and they're really exciting this year. Really, really exciting. Due to COVID arrangements, we need to make some amendments to how we normally eat, uh, not the physical activity of eating itself, but how the food will be presented to you. So please remain seated during morning tea and lunchtime. Food will be delivered to you at the table, and you'll be able to have a little lunch pack, um, and it might remind you of when you were back in primary school. That's how I'm looking at it. In regards to uh, question and answers, we've got a couple of uh, interview and uh, panels this afternoon, which will be fantastic. Uh, it, the, historically, we would walk around with a microphone, and uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we won't be doing that this year. So on your table, you actually have a QR code, and we're, gone, we're modernizing things this year. If you could scan the QR code, enter in any questions you like, feel free to send multiple questions throughout the day, We'll be asking those of our panel members a bit later on this afternoon. And most importantly, have fun. Enjoy yourself. It's, it's great to see you here. I'd like to take the opportunity now to invite Uncle Colin Walker, a uh, Yorta Yorta Nation traditional owner, to come up and do a welcome to country. Sorry I took so long to get here. Being an old man, it takes a bit of time. Uh, I'd just like to, Colin Walker's my name, uh, elder of the Yorta Yorta Nation. Uh, as I might have heard my story before, I was bred and born at Kamragunja. Uh, my grandmother was a midwife. I've been there just on 87 years now. Uh, so I'm only about, spread of about 400 metres or yards in them days away from the Murray. So I'd like to welcome you to Yorta Yorta country. Uh, to, uh, welcome to Yorta Yorta Waka Walla. That means land and water. So I hope we have a good day. And uh, uh, there's a lot of questions. Uh, I don't know about this fishing. We've got our own traditional ways of fishing, but we have to stick to some of the guidelines. And uh, some of you, Uncles out there, I'll call you as uncles, that means nana. Some of you old blokes that want to go fishing, don't be frightened to leave your wives and get out and do a bit of fishing because it shouldn't be an excuse for you. Get out there and do a bit of fishing and we'll see what laws there is and we'll see what sort of fish we could catch. So thank you very much and uh, thanks for listening to me. I'll be around for any questions to be asked. And I also would like to say... We, I do work with national parks. I work on both sides of the river. Uh, so there are diff two different acts I have to uh, work under. And we just do turtle surveys. And we've uh, just been uh, monitoring turtles. That was done five years ago. And they travelled through the waterways and flood water right down to nearly to Matara, where we met just uh, the other day. So a turtle's a slow mover. And it took him a long time to get down to where 
that where we had to check them out where we're, they were caught in nets. So they're the things we do with our young ones. There's Ted Lunts and stuff like that. We get all our young ones out in the forest and learn them everything that we know. Yeah, not from universities, but from here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle Colin. Really appreciate that. I'd like to take the opportunity now to invite up Gail Owen, the board of the BFA. Gail has been the inaugural chair of the BFA and overseen the establishment of the BFA since 2016. Gail is passionate about fishing. She lives on the Upper Colliburn Reservoir and she really gets out and about to all of our recreational fishing events and all of our commercial fishing events and comes and visits each and every one of the staff all across the state. She's someone who lives and breathes the BFA. She's overseeing a $100 million budget and at the moment, we're going through a significant boating and fishing infrastructure revolution. Welcome, Gail. That's my pre-COVID haircut. This is my post-COVID uh, haircut. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Yorta Yorta land on which we're gathering today and pay my respects to their elders past present um, and emerging. I'd also particularly like to thank Uncle Colin Walker for his welcome to his lands and for doing us the honour of attending today and for allowing us the privilege of calling him Uncle. Thank you for inviting me into the family, Uncle Colin. Uh, it's really wonderful to, I actually can't see any people out there, but I know you're there because when I was down there I could see you. <laughs> uh, people who aren't on a screen. We've all spent the last few years on a screen and I guess we're all pretty sick of it. Uh, although we do still have to take precautions because COVID's still out there and people are still dying. However, we're all allowed to go fishing again and that's just a wonderful thing. Uh, amazingly, the BFA has managed to, as has the rest of the world, uh, coped pretty well with the pandemic. There've been challenges, plenty of difficulties uh, but the staff of the VFA have done a terrific job in uh, carrying out all the various commitments that we have, particularly fish stocking, uh, the new Arcadia hatchery, which I'm going to visit on my way home this afternoon, uh, has, is pretty well uh, operational. Still has a bit of work there to be done, but uh, it's, it's actually up and running and has fish in the ponds. So all the work that we do to keep recreational fishers as happy as we're permitted to do, uh, bearing in mind all the other regulations that we have to put up with as well, uh, has been going on as usual, notwithstanding the pandemic. Conference, of course, uh, we had to change one of them to an online one. And this one, of course, would have normally been held in December <coughs> last year, but we didn't move it to this period of time in the hope that we could meet and indeed for once <laughs> our hopes have been realised. Uh, I can assure you that plenty of them got dashed during the last couple of years when we all assumed that it was all going to be over and of course it wasn't. However, we all are back together. Uh, we've got a great lineup of people today. Uh, I know the setup's a bit different. Hopefully it will work. Uh, we're obviously not as big as we've been in the past but I'm sure we'll be brighter. Uh, we've certainly got lots of enthusiasm that's built up over the time and we're really looking forward to the sessions uh, and more importantly, perhaps, being able to chat with one another uh, during the breaks. So please enjoy your day. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. It's, uh, as an employee of the BFA, it's fantastic to have such a uh, strong, passionate person leading our organisation who loves fishing. It's terrific. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite the, another person who's just as passionate about recreational fishing and who's uh, not bad to work for either, the CEO of the BFA, Mr Travis Dowling. Uh, thanks, Chris, and good morning, everyone. It is absolutely fantastic to be here in Shepparton, and uh, it's, you know, it's just wonderful to see all of your smiley faces and 
to have a room full of passionate cod fishermen, yellow fishers, people who chase silvers, uh, people who just love freshwater fishing across Victoria. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Uncle Cole Walker and the Yorta Yorta people, the, the land that we're on today, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm going to make uh, a little bit of what we do in the next sort of 10 minutes pretty interactive and, uh, and get a few of you to, uh, to yell a few things out at me. Um, I know some of you would be looking for that opportunity for a number of years. Uh, but I think we're going to have a little bit of fun. Now I'm going to try and see if my clicker works here. Hang on. Alrighty, I can't quite get my clicker working. Uh -huh. Alright, we've got a bit of technical difficulty there. Ah, oh, there we go. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna, that was me doing that on the clicker. No, it absolutely was not. Alright, so uh, just to kick things off, you're going to see some wonderful faces up on the screen behind you, behind me. There we go, thank you. Ah, oh, cheers. Uh, some of these people are the most inspiring cod fishers that you would come across. Some are quite new to cod fishing. But some of the people up there have had a really strong influence over my cod fishing growing up. But also, more recently, uh, my transition, which Sam Consola will find very hard to believe, from bait into lures. And uh, what I'm going to do is, can you, if you can name who's up on that screen, the last person to get the last name is going to get one of these lures. All right, so yell out a name, it's the last name. So I'm about to hear about 200 voices yell out names. So any names up there you recognise, any faces? All right, Fifey's one, gone. Tiffany's two, gone. Sam Consolo, three, gone. Julia Menzies, four, gone. Now we've got Fifey. Awkward silence. Think they are fish. John Cahill. John Cahill's up there. Monster cod out of Eildon. Great. Who's this bloke down here in the right hand corner holding that cod up in the tinny, standing up? <laughs> Lives up at Swan Hill. Sorry, what are you then? Yeah, that's Rob Lotes. Rob Lotes there. Who's the bloke in the top left hand corner? holding that cod that I think ended up winning him $10,000 at the Mowala Cod Classic. I could be wrong. Who is it? Who was that? Yeah. Yep, who yelled that out? Okay, Karen, you're not actually allowed to win this, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, you, you will win it. But, um, yeah, so, so that group of people is just an inspiring group of people, and many of you within this room should be up on that screen and in terms of what you're bringing to cod fishing and how cod fishing is changing in Victoria. And we'll have a bit of a chat about that, but gone are the days when it was 30 set lines, it was bait, it was, um, uh, there was no bag limits, there was no size limits. Now, Victoria's cod fishery now has changed so much and the people who are fishing for cod, some of them have changed, but some of them have also adapted the way that they fish for cod. So, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I remember when we first brought in, you know, I banned on set lines and we first brought in some of the bag limits and size limits, there were, real concern from people that it was going to destroy the beauty of the fishery that they'd loved for so long, but it really hasn't. And, uh, you know, you hear people talk about fish in the slot and outside the slot and the big ones that they've released, but that is wonderful seeing the different ages, the different gender, the different demographics of people now fishing for cod. So that's wonderful. We might kick on to the next slide. That's all right. I might see if this works now. Uh -oh. Nope. Can we move to the next slide? Okay, alrighty. I've now got two lures up for grabs because uh, Karen won the first one. <laughs> she probably doesn't need it. Alright, who are these people up on the screen? Give me some names. Anthony Forster's one. That's Anthony down there on the left hand side. Anthony caught a 55 centimetre trout cod last night, not too far away from here, on an Anthony Forster special single blade spinner bait. He's a bit of a master at that. Alright. Top left-hand side, Craig Ingram, very good. All right, I'm not going to give you any more clues because whoever gets the last three or the last one gets both of these lures. Corey. Yep, Corey, very good work. Corey is the bloke on the right-hand side and he was out fishing with John Fife this week and I think that's a picture of a cod that they got this week in the Upper Goulburn but I'm not going to steal the thunder from their prezzo. All right, the very, uh, the very smiley bloke up the top. 
Brian Mottram. Brian's heading up our Arcadia and, work, and Snob Creek, Snobs Creek hatcheries and working through all of our fish production and stocking. And the bloke in the middle, anyone yells it out, they get two lures. All right, there was about six people here. <laughs> Right, that hand right at the back there with the sunglasses on. I see you. Hang on a second. And Pato's going to go and sort this for me. There we go. There we go, mate. That bloke right at the back. Over there. Yep, yeah, over there with a the hand up. Right, -o. Thank you. Okay, can we go to the next one? All right. So this is just, before I just jump on a little bit, of, bit more stuff, this is a little bit about uh, uh, me and my family. And my family are here today, and that's... Um, that's my nephew, Jack, on the left-hand side. That's my dad with him with the green hat on. And that's Jack, and he's just sitting at the front here in a blue hoodie. And that's, that's my mum and dad and my brother and my family. That's my son there on the left-hand side. And that's my brother up there with a the cod. And that was uh, not that long ago, fishing the Edwards River up at Moulamine. And, you know, we grew up doing that. And we've done that all of our lives. And we now fish uh, for cod all across Victoria. And sometimes we venture into New South Wales as well. But, you know, it is something that brings people together cod fishing and it is certainly something that you know I think everyone in this room that the reason why you're here and you're so passionate about uh, is you know it, it's not just about the fish it's about the surroundings it's about the campfire um, it's about the sunsets and the sunrises and what you see when you're out in the river and when you're drifting down okay can I just go to the next photo all right so I'm just gonna before I sort of wrap up too much that's my lovely partner Katie that cod was a 78 centimetre Murray cod caught about 20 kilometres from here on the Goulburn River. Now that fish was caught for the first time four years ago. It sits on a snag opposite a beach, about three metres out from this beach, and it sits under that snag, and it will only come out at night. And the first time we caught that cod was about 8.30 at night, and it came out and it took a yabby tail on a circle hook that we, uh, that we just had set up there while we were actively fishing and also cooking dinner. In the next two years, we've caught that cod two more times. Once on a bunch of shrimp, much to Sam Consolo's disgust, it wasn't a lure, and then once on a full yabby. And it's grown from 78 centimetres each year. Now, we've used circle hooks and stainless steel hooks, so that fish has been released happily each time. But it's the same fish, and it sits under the same snag exactly where we camp. Can I go to the next slide? That was a week ago. All right, on the uh, Goulburn River. I'm sorry I look so bleary-eyed and I'm not probably dressed appropriately for work, but that was a week ago on the Goulburn River and that's the same cod. I probably could be holding it better, but it's now 87 centimetres and it lives under that snag. And, uh, and we love this fish and it was released again, but it's now been caught four times uh, and it creates these amazing memories and this incredible experience. Uh, she gets a bit annoyed when she gets caught, but she swims back under a snag and and, you know, and we, you know, we'll keep going back there and saying hello to her each year. Just, you know, the Goulburn River right at our back door here, just some incredible fish. Um, I'd really like to say today, and I'm not going to speak too much longer, that we have an amazing opportunity in front of us, and I talk about this each year. We have a government at the moment that's committed $71 million over the last six years into fishing. We have a standalone Victorian Fisheries Authority that's dedicated to fishing. And we have people like VR Fish and Native Fish Australia and Future Fish and Trelly and you know, Sam Consolo's you know, um, Native Fish page and Johnny Cahill and all of the people you're going to hear from today. John, we've got all of these absolutely wonderful ambassadors and enthusiastic people supporting fishing. We're stocking 10 million fish in Victoria this year. That's more fish being stocked in Victoria than every other state in Australia put together. And when you consider that a million of those are going to go into Eildon, a million will go into Epilock, a million will go into an emerging fishery at Rocklands, which wouldn't have happened without VR Fisher's um, advocacy in that space. Now, what we're setting ourselves up for is the next 10 to 15 years of just incredible fishing. Sadly, I, I was on a houseboat at Wentworth after Christmas, and the darling below Pooncarry and all the way from uh, you know, just above Wentworth there, we fished for a week and caught about 500 carp and didn't see a cod. Now, A, that's because I'm not the best fisherman in the world, and B, you know, it, it's just a bit of a tragedy in some other parts of the Murray-Darling Basin that we don't have the recovery that we're seeing in Victoria. But it's not an accident, and it hasn't just happened. It's because of the work and the investment that's been put in. The habitat work, the flows, the stocking, the size and bag limits, and all the management arrangements. 
I just want to give a shout out uh, as well to the work that's been done on Macquarie Perch, to thank all of our partners that are assisting on that. We stocked 145,000 Macquarie Perch this year. We're bringing back a large bodied native species that used to be so endemic in our cold water um, you know, and got really knocked about over many years. We've got, to, we've got to crack the code on captive breeding for Macquarie Perch. I'm not going to talk about Arcadia because we've got some wonderful speakers to have a chat about that. I do want to also uh, mention that we are going to commence next week salvaging native fish out of Greens Lake, which is not too far away from here, relocating some of the yellows to uh, Ranga Basin and utilising some of the cod probably at Arcadia. Uh, Greens Lake sadly you know, won't be available moving forward as a great fishery, but hopefully Waranga Basin will. And very exciting for all of us, uh, Victoria has nailed uh, hosting the World Recreational Fishing Conference in Melbourne next year. So in 2023, we'll have three to 4,000 people travelling from all over the world to look at how we manage and grow and support recreational fishing in Victoria next year. Uh, just, just before I wrap up and the next, the next speaker comes on, some of the challenges that we have and some of the things that I know that we can, uh, we can address together and we can work through together. Uh, Inner Valley Trade down the Goulburn River, uh, you know, we can't have the Goulburn River running at five to six metres during summer when it should be running at less than a metre um, you know, below Murchison. That, that Inner Valley Trade, as it pushes that cold water down, that does irreparable damage to the uh, breeding and the recovery of our, you know, our Murray cod, our silver perch, our trout cod, and also our uh, spiny craze. So there's got to be another way. You know, either that water goes through a channel system or, or that water goes through winter, but we can't have that water pushing down uh, cold in summer. Look, access to Crown land, it can, it'll continue to be a challenge for all of us. And, you know, it's not just about trying to get access where we, where we don't have it currently. It's about maintaining and protecting the access that we do have. And as we've seen with COVID, a lot of people have moved out of Melbourne and they're moving to regional Victoria. And some of those people are coming and wanting to create, which is fine, wanting to create a little piece of paradise of their own. But where they're putting gates uh, up where there haven't been gates previously on public roads and padlocks on, on uh, public Crown land reserves, that's a challenge for all of us. And we need to continue to work through that to maintain that access to the fishery that we have. The good old carp virus, I'm sure it was gonna come up today, where are we at with the carp virus? Well, the latest news from the Commonwealth is that they are further considering the carp virus, uh, National Carp Action Plan, and that they will be making a decision soon on that. And from a Victorian point of view, even though I think we're on top of carp in many waterways, on, in others, they continue to cause us all sorts of problems. So uh, the virus, I know there are different views and different thoughts on it. Um, you know, my strong view is that the virus will be a really good thing for the recovery of our continued recovery of our native species. And if we can get small bodied um, smelt, galaxids, gudgeons and others back into our waterways as the bait source and the food source for our large bodied natives rather than carp and the damage that they do, I think that is a wonderful uh, thing for our next generations of fishers. But that is it for me. It is wonderful to see you all. I'm looking forward to having a, um, a tea and coffee with you. And thank you very much for coming and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Trav. Really good to hear that uh, presentation from you. And uh, first time I've ever seen a picture of you with actually holding a fish. Um, heard lots of stories about you catching fish. Never actually seen any physical evidence um, particularly these days with what you can do with technology and doctoring photos. Uh, I'd like to invite our next, our next guest speaker up. Anthony Forster is his name and he's the project manager overseeing delivery of Arcadia uh, fish hatchery. Anthony previously held the role of inland fisheries managers before working on the hatchery. And he, if you don't know this, he actually studied in Tasmania. Uh, and managed the first marine salmon farm down there way back in 1985. That industry is now valued at over $1 billion annually. After working in Tassie for 10 years, Anthony returned to Melbourne in 1995 when he started working for Victorian Fisheries. Anthony's led a range of recreational fishing improvement projects, including the Murray Cod Slot Limit Regulations, the Million Murray Cod Lake Yildon Project, 
the Care for Cod and the Estuary Perch Breeding and Stocking Program, to name but a few. Anthony is a passionate recreational fisher who makes his own lures and loves connecting with nature through fishing. Anthony. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. And uh, I didn't put that photo up. Someone else dropped it in. But it was a good cod. Uh, Crane Gigram put me onto that fish and that was in the Goulburn River a few years ago on a homemade spinnerbait. And uh, I never, never forgotten that catch. All right, let's talk about Arcadia. Uh, I have no clickers, but someone's going to help me navigate. Is that right? OK. Here we go. I love this photo. I know it's, uh, it's something you've seen before, but I just love um, the iconic colour of the green and gold Murray cod just inspires me and uh, it's, a, it's a fitting front piece for this presentation. I wanted to talk to you about um, where we're at with Arcadia. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of the design inspirations. Um, I want to talk about the building progress so far. I'd like to also talk to you about our first harvest, which has been really good. Um, and also talk about next steps and finally I want to talk about a visitors facility which is pretty exciting as well. Okay, first slide. So here's a sneak peek of where we're at, where we're at with our Arcadia fish farm. Um, this is about two months old, this photograph. Aerial shot um, showing um, uh, 32, 33 ponds of which are about half of them are being utilised at this stage. Um, on the left top are the brew ponds, um, central are the plankton ponds, and um, I'll talk about some more features as we go through, but um, really excited about Arcadia. It's coming together beautifully, and the earthworks are completed, we're growing fish, and they're exceeding our expectations. So uh, let's talk a bit more about it. Next slide. Okay, just to remind you, what's our vision here? Why do we need a native fish hatchery? Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, our rivers have changed profoundly. They don't perform like they used to. Um, native fish desperately need uh, flood scenarios. They need unregulated systems. Our systems are highly regulated with um, dams and weirs and barriers to fish movement. Um, we've lost wetland connectivity. Um, we've got uh, carp throughout the system. We've got unseasonal flows, et cetera, et cetera. That's the pragmatic world we live in. If we did nothing uh, other than hope to restore river health, our native fish populations would continue to decline. So fish stocking overcomes what we call a recruitment bottleneck, which is fancy for our native fish need help in breeding. Now, why are we doing this? We want to recover our native fish uh, populations, um, most of which are threatened. Um, if we do that, we'll create uh, terrific new recreational fisheries and we'll grow fishing tourism. And fishing tourism is terrific for the regions particularly. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of uh, secondary benefits to come from fishing, you know, connectivity with nature, uh, uh, connectivity with family and friends, mental health time away from work and all those sorts of things. They're really profound and, and deeply nourishing. Next slide. Okay, I wanted to talk just quickly about what's inspired us at Arcadia and it's essentially it's pretty straightforward. We've copied nature at every turn. We've created light um, nest boxes which are surrogates uh, for hollow logs. Now, hollow logs are critically important for native fish, particularly Murray cod, because Murray cod need hard substrate to lay their adhesive eggs into, and they need to guard those eggs from predators, and the male fish does that, and hangs around for up to 10 days in that process. So hollow logs are ideal. So we need hollow logs, so what have we done? We've built a hollow log made out of aluminium, um, lined with um, fly screen. So again, inspiration from nature. We've got um, plankton ponds at Arcadia, which are no more than flooded wetlands. Because we know that when dry land or dry wetland is flooded with water in late spring, 
magical things happen. Productivity goes through the roof. Zooplankton and algae bloom. And that's the food that drives the future generation. That's the larval feed for native fish. So that's what we've done at Arcadia. Next slide. Again, inspired by nature, um, we use a gravity harvesting system at, at uh, Arcadia. And that's about, in a natural system, when you get a spring flood, which would have occurred on a more regular basis than it does, the water washes across the landscape and then sits in these wetlands, which become incredibly productive. And the juvenile fish that are drawn in um, to those wetlands thrive on that food. And when it floods next time, the whole system is reconnected and the fish swim back. So that's the natural cycle that would have occurred that happens very infrequently now. But again, we've just copied that. So using gravity flow is a really simple principle. The other thing is that using gravity flow means that we never have to touch a native fish again. Now that sounds simple, but it's profound. And it's profound because every time we net the fish, we take the slime off the fish, we damage the scales of the fish. The fish thrashing on top of each other cause all sorts of problems. They get stressed. And when fish get stressed and damaged, even lightly, we see that present itself three to five days later with what we call suppressed immune response. So they become vulnerable to opportunist bacteria and, uh, and other parasites. So by having a system that delivers fish effectively to the river without any netting is a huge design plus for us at Arcadia. And we're very confident that the number of fish that survive on will be significantly enhanced by this, by this design initiative. So simple but really valuable. Next one. OK, let's talk about the build. This is a happy snap of uh, what we've done so far. OK, here we go. We're going to talk about ponds. The pond construction, uh, we used a company called Apex. It cost us $1.8 million. Local company at Shepparton. Um, you can't see it from looking at the ponds, but there's an enormous amount of deep underground piping that went into this design. And here are the guys digging trenches and connecting pipe work. Very large PVC pipe work as well. So that's a sense of, um, of that design. Also, you'll notice that the soil is fairly uniform. There's very high amounts of clay. And clay is really important for sealing ponds. And that was one of the key features of the, uh, of the property. Next shot. Here's a, here's a snapshot um, during development. It just shows you the underground piping that we've put in place. All of the ponds have been sloped so that they gravity flow. And there are concrete sumps that we put in place as well in each one. Next slide. Another shot of the uh, excavation. Um, I'll just show you this because it's, you can't see it from looking at the ponds, but there's in this elaborate network of not only uh, PVC piping, but electrical conduits right through the whole system. OK, next slide. Um, here's a walk, walkway that we've put out to each, each of 20 plankton ponds. Um, and that's, that blue thing is where the, um, the standpipe will be that drain the, the ponds. Um, and around that standpipe will be, um, or we've, we have installed a concrete geomat um, product, uh, which is smooth sort of transition of, of uh, concrete that slopes down to that central point. And that's been a bit of an innovation as well. Much more gentle on the fish. At every turn, we're looking to minimise the impact on fish. OK, next one. Here's an example of how we fill the ponds. Uh, we've got 200 megalitres of, of bore water, and uh, that bore water is delivered to that location. Um, each pond is 60 metres by 30 metres, 1.8 megalitres it holds, and it will fill comfortably overnight. And our bore, bore water is exceptional. Next one. Here's an example of the construction of the bore. This is a fairly significant undertaking. Uh, it was a key site criteria for choosing the property at Arcadia. Uh, we struck terrific deep groundwater at 74 metres and the water quality is exceptional. It's 
it's actually drinking, drinking quality water. And once you evaporate um, some, of the, um, some of the iron that comes out of the system, which is natural. So delighted with the water, we went out to the market to buy uh, some of that water and um, we've got that secured now as a, as a constant uh, allocation. Next slide. Um, this is our pride and joy. This is what we call our harvest station or a harvest bunker. It looks like a big ice skating rink or a, a roller skating rink. But that's during construction. It's about two and a half metres underground. Um, and what happens is all of the ponds drain into that central location through a complicated series of valves, which means the fish come to us, which means that we don't have to jump into it, or our guys don't have to jump into the ponds at five o'clock in the morning with nets, shoveling fish into buckets and walking up and down slippery slopes for three hours. We don't have to do that anymore, which has been a profound improvement in the system. So that's pretty revolutionary. Um, this, this idea came from Noel Penfold, but we've taken it to the next le level. Noel Penfold is a, a fantastic uh, pioneering fish farm who had one of the largest Murray Cod fish farms in Australia, has recently retired. Okay, next slide. Uh, here's a pond being drained and in the foreground uh, paddle wheel aerators, really important to keep the oxygen going through the ponds. And uh, as you can see that as the ponds drain, they're, they're drained or they're sloped so that all fish uh, migrate to that deeper spot. There are no fish caught in, in any puddles of any, of any kind. So the slope of the, the ponds are really important. Next one. Um, this is something a bit interesting. Um, we had on the farm an existing herringbone milking shed, which we've converted to a quarantine station and a fingling intake uh, area. But what happens is the native fish on harvest are brought into this location. They're lifted up on a, on a blue tub and they're gravity fed into these holding uh, systems where we sort the mud eyes, for example, from the fish. Uh, we give them a salt treatment. Uh, we count them and we weigh them and the next day they're back out in the river. Uh, so that's how that works. So that's been a terrific um, value add, if you like, using, utilising that existing facility. Next one. Okay, people. Uh, we've got three full-time staff at the moment. Uh, we will be employing another two people in the near future. And first photo, here they are, the legends. Um, so on the left, we've got Jared McGowan. He's a fish production um, expert, lives and breeds fish, loves counting plankton. Um, poached from New South Wales Fisheries. In the middle we've got Ryan Berniston. Now Ryan has had a lot of experience working with one of the leading companies in Australia who design aquaculture systems. I and mean, we brought him down from the Gold Coast. Uh, Ryan's a terrific asset for us. And then James, James on the right, James Milne is uh, a local, he's probably in the audience. Um, we've got him to look after the property and as a bonus he's a qualified plumber and he's got tickets to do just about anything in terms of excavation work. So he's been a real asset for us. So we've got terrific mix of skills between these three people. Um, and they're just so positive in how they go about it. So we're really happy with that. Next one. Here's Steve. How could I not include Steve Vidler? Steve Vidler, uh, ex-manager of Snobs Creek, now a private contractor, fell in love, went to the Gold Coast, hard to get him back but we've, we pinch him uh, every summer to come and give us a hand at Snobs Creek. And he provides a mentor service, but also he's had a big role in helping us design the facility at Arcadia. Next one. Um, we're also, we also have a 50% Indigenous employment target uh, at Arcadia. And to help that along, we've set up a training course with Gote Shepton. We had 18 enrolments in the first year, 50% were Indigenous. And in, those Indigenous people came from three communities. So we will um, offer two scholarships, two Indigenous scholarship positions from people that have come through that course. And um, it's been terrific to work with, particularly Yorta Yorta, and some Indigenous people that are desperately interested in native fish. And 
What a lovely thing to be able to do in terms of care for country, grow threatened native fish and stock them in your rivers and be a part of that process. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about growing fish. What have we done? What do we do? Um, Broodfish, plankton ponds and the hatchery. Our focus initially will be on golden perch and Murray cod. Next slide. Here's a, a fat golden perch. Um, we've been collecting these, sending them to Snobs Creek. Snobs Creek have been um, uh, fertilising these, stripping and fertilising these eggs and uh, the larvae have then been coming across to our cave for grow out purposes. Uh, you can see that that's a big female fish. You see the extended papillae, that means the, uh, the vent at the bottom. That means she's ready to go. And golden perch have got really high fecundity, lots and lots of eggs. Um, and if, if it all goes well, they'll grow very quickly in our plankton ponds, and they have already. Next slide. Here's a big Murray cod. We have more than 150 huge Murray cod stacked away in a dozen farm dams throughout northern Victoria. Um, adjusted, if you like, um, and uh, these will be returned to Arcadia in the next month or so, as soon as we have available fish transportation to do that. So that's going to be a terrific asset, asset for us. Next slide. Here's this, I just thought I'd put this in. This is uh, the adhesive eggs of Murray Cod. It's incredible how Murray Cod at that size deposit their eggs so evenly across a single surface. And that's important because if they clump them together, there'd be um, fungal infections that occur. So I just thought that was a fascinating story. And that's typically what we get uh, from the nest boxes and we bring into the hatchery. And then in a number of days, um, uh, they hatch and they've got large yolk sacs and we feed them with artemia. And a couple of weeks later, they're ready to go out in the plankton ponds. Next one. And this is, this is our pride and joy. This is called a Daphnia or a water flea. This variety is called a mega Daphnia or a mega water flea. We weren't sure what this, we weren't sure how our plankton ponds would perform at Arcadia because they rely on the zooplankton and the algal spores that are in the soil. So it's a bit of a lucky dip. Um, anyone who grows native fish, these are the jewel in the crown. If you can get these things going in a plankton pond, they create terrific food source for our native fish and they're like lollies to, to native fish. And I'm really pleased to say we have got millions and millions of these mega Daphne at, at, uh, at Arcadia. Okay, next one. And the end product is uh, a handful of, of beautiful Murray cod which will, uh, which will go out into rivers. Um, so far, I can tell you that we have stocked six, sorry, we have stocked over 800,000 larvae into Arcadia. We have harvested six ponds. We've harvested uh, close to 200,000 fish already this season. And we've got another eight ponds to go. So we're well and truly on track. So our, our Arcadia ponds are performing as good, if not better, than we hoped. Next slide. Here's just a snapshot of our first harvest. This is a very proud period for us and our, and our guys. Um, and uh, just the next click. And just to point you out, and one more. Yeah, this fish here is 1.6 gram golden perch that grew from a larvae, a microscopic larvae, um, to that size in 40 days, which is a record. Far better growth than we're getting at um, Snobs Creek because as designed um, Arcadia is in a warmer climate, a much warmer climate. So productivity is going through the roof, we're really pleased. Next one. So also I'll just talk a little bit about our visitor centre. In addition to a seven million dollar state government initiative around building a hatchery at Arcadia or a native fish farm at Arcadia, um, we've also secured three million dollars from the state government to build a visitor centre. And our plans for the visitor centre are that we have a building, and we have that building surrounded by wetlands, we do some landscaping, we have interpretive signs, we have barbecue shelters, we have a big Murray Cod statue at the front, uh, we have a fishy themed playground, amenities, car parking, 
and we have a big fish out facility. So it's going to be a, a full package for a family, family day out. Now this process is in train at the moment. We've just gone out to the, we're just about to go out to tender on the construction. We think that the native fish hatchery will educate people about native fish in the landscape, also educate people about indigenous culture, tell wonderful stories about people's encounter with monster Murray cod and golden perch, talk about how uh, fishing has really um, added terrific social dimension um, to our community. And, you know, inspire the next generation to care more about native fish and to, you know, push back on some of the challenges that Trev, Trev, Travis mentioned around, you know, reversal of seasonal flows which are causing so much damage to native fish. So we think it adds terrific value, but it's not only educational, it's going to be a terrific picnic opportunity. Um, there will be lots and lots of fish stock in, that, in, the, in our little dam, our Arcadia Pondage, for kids to fish as the end point of that trip. Next one. Here's a quick snapshot of some of the, um, uh, some of the drawings around the Arcadia Pondage. Next one. Uh, next slide. Yep, and here's our Arcadia fish pondage. This is a 50 megalitre dam. It's 160 metres by 160 metres. We're going to landscape it. We're going to make it really family friendly. We're just about to stock one tonne of yabbies in there. Uh, we've put already some structure in there and we're going to create more of a natural landscape. It'll be really well stocked with native fish. Next photo. And just, little, just, just finally, last steps. Um, we, need, we intend to grow... What's that? I've got a bite. I'm sure I've got a bite. Uh, grow fish more season. Bring brood fish onto the farm. That happens in the next month or so. Complete the hatchery by September and build the visitor centre by October. Next slide. Um, this is a quick snapshot just to leave you with um, the visuals of our farm. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anthony. Have you noticed the constant theme from our speakers this morning, and you'll see it throughout the rest of the day, but they're all really passionate about what they're doing. And very exciting as a VFA employee to see a once-in-a-generation fish hatchery and the infrastructure that's being built to support it moving forward. Really exciting as a staff member to see that happen in my time. Uh, I'd like to invite our next guest speaker to come up, Catherine Gregg, who's the Director of Better Boating Victoria and also the Fishing and Boating Infrastructure Division within the VFA, which includes general oversight of Anthony and the fish hatchery development at Arcadia. Catherine has worked in the marine and ports industry for over a decade, including more recently establishing Better Boating Victoria in 2019. She's established a team of nine really hard-working, dedicated project managers and their enthusiasm for delivery of projects has been infectious throughout the rest of the VFA. The team have already delivered free boat ramps, a range of improved boating facilities, and they're currently delivering strategic boating initiatives as outlined in the recently released Victorian Recreational Boating Strategy. When she's not building boat ramps or boat facilities, she's off fishing a river somewhere in the northeast. Welcome, Catherine.
buzzer works. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, Better Boating Victoria was brought into the Victorian Fisheries Authority about just over a year ago, and it's just a perfect marriage. Um, so while we're here talking a lot about fishing and, and cod, um, I think we're just as much about boating as we are fishing. Can I just grab a show of hands for those out there who do actually have a boat or use boats to go fishing? Yeah, my people, awesome. Um, so, look, that makes me really happy and I'm going to run through uh, to show you um, the, the revolution that's happening in boating in Victoria, thanks to, uh, to Travis Dowling and the Victorian Government. Um, I'm not a cod fisher, I should say that, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a trout fisher, but, um, you know, Benny Scullin owes me a, a fishing trip on Mulwala where we are going to give it a crack, so I'm just going to... Uh, run through a bit of a presentation just to outline what, what we do. So as Chris mentioned, we're a small team. We're a team of uh, nine people. Um, we're very passionate about, about what we do. Um, and we've, we've recruited you know, a gun team of, of project managers who do nothing but deliver for, uh, for our boaters out there across the, across the state. Just to give you an overview of the projects that we're doing at the moment, while we've got a lot happening around Port Phillip and Western Port, we've also got a lot of projects happening around the, around the state. Um, and I'm going to particularly focus on those sort of in the, in the northern part of the, part of the state. And that's over 210 projects that we're, we're delivering and developing at the moment um, over the last year. So there's quite a lot of projects. Part of our model when we go to upgrade a facility, a boat ramp, is that we, we get a, um, we, we understand we put the users of those facilities for first and foremost. So to make sure we, we set up a bit of a stakeholder group, we make sure we understand what the needs are of that, of that facility, what needs to happen to make it better. Um, and then we'll go away, we'll take that information, we'll go and talk to, you know, engineers. Um, who will design a bit of a concept, we'll come back and we'll put that out there publicly. So just to get some feedback before we do any minor changes or, or tweaks to the design. And then that's basically what we run with. And we put that through a design, uh, a detailed design and an approvals process so we can actually um, get on and, and develop um, and deliver a project. That's not a short process. It's not a quick process to get approvals um, and to, from, from the the point where you actually meet with people to understand to actually going through and starting to turn some dirt on the on the ground um, at best case it's 12 to 18 months um, a lot longer if you need some more extensive approvals so it doesn't happen quickly just um, I'm just going to quickly touch on some of the work that we're doing around Port Phillip and Western Port for those who do go down to um, to the base to fish so we as part of the election commitments we had six projects to deliver and we're in the final stages of delivering those so we did some work to the cows jetty um, we've in, we've done some work around morty Alec creek so we're about to go in next week and start with the, the car park there and try and get some more boat ramp uh, sorry boat car trailer parks in there but we've done some work on the jetties and the, the ramp there we're going in tomorrow to Rill to do the second part of that project on Phillip Island so that includes um, replacing and having longer longer ramps and pontoons and jetties out at Rill. Um, Point Richards, um, which is the top uh, right-hand corner, we're about to go out and build a bit of a rock groin there to keep the seagrass from coming in there. Hastings, we're about to go in and do a final dredge and put in a really long second pontoon there and with a disabled uh, a, a davit, so um, for all, all abilities access at, at Hastings. And we're about to shut Queenscliff um, in, in mid-March for a few months while we go in there and include, install a third lane, extra pontoon and some longer jetties and pontoons there. So we've got lots of work happening around Port Phillip and Western Port. These are the ones that, you know, we, we're required to deliver in the next couple of months and the others are coming along um, really well. Got a number of other uh, projects that we're working on around the state. Um, the top left is Curdy Vale, Boggy Creek. So that's what that looks like in um, at 
in mid-year. Um, we've actually re resealed, we've, we've sealed that and we're line marking that in the next couple of weeks. So that's a great project. Lake Bull and Merai, we are um, going in, in, in uh, ne next week actually, and we're going to be closing that facility at Bull and Merai and I apologise to all the Chinook fishermen there, but we need to, to do that to be able to replace that facility there. And we're going to have a fantastic two lane facility with a, a, a lovely central pontoon. Um, and that's going to be a, a great project. Warnerbal boat ramp, um, we're going to be um, fixing that pretty much from May. So the contractor who's doing Bull and Merai is also going to be doing Warnerbal. So they're going to finish Bull and Merai, move to Warnerbal, and that's going to be an awesome facility there. We're just going to be replacing those jetties we're dredging, so to deflect some of the wave action that impacts that facility at the moment. Um, and North Arm, that's a, um, that project will be finished this month as well. So that's near the Game Fishing Club for those that, that know the North Arm there. But we're you know, replacing having some longer jetties and pontoons there and moving the sports fishing gantry to sit on the water side of it so that they can hook up their, their swordfish. Um, and it's, it's an improvement there. We're doing some work at Lake Belfield. Um, we're designing some, some improvements there. With Lake Wartook, you know, we're, we're fixing the car trailer park there and we've just announced some funding at Apollo Bay where we're gonna have two, uh, we have new 50 metre long pontoons there and another big dredge there to make that a better facility. I'm just gonna focus on some specific projects um, in the north now. So Waranga Basin, um, as you know, fisheries, we do, we, we do a lot of work there with fish habitat and stocking. Um, we're working also closely with Gold and Murray Water to double the length, uh, sorry, double the width of Harriman Point boat ramp there. So it's going to be duplicated. We're going to be doing some work in the car park there um, and having an improved car park. And that work is expected to kick off next month in March. We're just waiting on the water levels. It's all impacted by water levels. But um, that'll be pretty much March till June and Harriman Point will be a much better facility. So just keep your eyes on that one. For those that fish in the northeast, we've got uh, some, we're doing some work with Parks Victoria to improve some facilities at, at, on the Midamida, so at Pigs Point. Um, the Murray downstream of Wodonga, so Richardson's Reserve, um, and also Doolan's Reserve and Shaw's Flat. So we've been waiting probably for a good six months to fix these facilities, but again, we've been impacted by water levels. So as soon as that water level drops, um, we'll be able to get in there and just improve those, those facilities there. Um, we have provided around about a million dollars to Grampians Wimra Mallee Water to improve some facilities at Rockland, Tolondo and Lake Lonsdale. So for those that know Rockland, um, there's a basic access point at Hines. What we're going to be doing there with Grampians Wimra Mallee is actually building a concrete ramp in at Hines and we're also going to be providing um, an improved sort of compacted car park there. So um, we're just working through approvals with, with Grampians Wimra Mallee and hopefully mid-year we'll be able to have that work done. Um, with Tolondo, it's a similar thing. We've got a, we've got a really flat um, access point there that's going to be concreted and we're going to be doing some work to the car car park there and at Lake Lonsdale we're going to be duplicating that ramp there um, so we'll be um, and, and there'll be some dredging work that'll be happening as well so that'll be an, a much better access point as well the Golden River so just here um, it's in our action plan for this year. Um, I know that me and my team have been sort of, you know, looking at this probably for I reckon about 18 months. Um, and we're very close to being announced to announce who will be doing this work for us, but basically looking at a, a ramp to access the Goulburn downstream of the weir. So this point here is actually just, well, that's at the weir itself. Um, and as you know, there's probably no formal access between this point and Echuca. Um, so we're looking at, at getting a concept and some, some designs where we can um, provide a, a, a decent access point here in, in Shep. Um, so we're hopeful that we can, we can make the weir site work, um, but 
we'll see what our uh, maritime engineers say when, when we've got them on board to, um, to do this work. But stand by for some consultation. So once we've got a design, as I said, we'll put that out there publicly and we'll be able to get some feedback through that process. Um, and I think we're working closely with the Undera Angling Club on, on this as well and, and uh, the Golden Valley uh, Association of, of Clubs there. Halcott Inlet, this is something that we, we, we've heard quite a lot about as well, just providing uh, improved access on, on Eildon. So again, we're working with Golden Murray Water and Mansfield Council, and we're developing a, uh, a concept for a new ramp at, and parking at, at Halcott. So we're close to um, being able to yeah, kick off on this work. Um, so we're going to do, it's, it's quite, it can be quite shallow there, so we've got to do a bit of bathy surveys there. Um, looking at having an improved access, like a, a proper ramp there, and some um, land side works there to make to make a new facility at Halkwa work. So we're excited about that. Mildura, um, so in the northwest, um, we are working with uh, Mildura City Council and. Uh, Parks Victoria as well as the Environment Department to look at what we can do to provide access, uh, better access at Redcliffe and, and uh, Caradoc. And uh, for those that know sort of that part of the world, it's, it's interesting, I was up there at Easter or just, um, and you go on the New South Wales side of the river and they've got these amazing facilities, sort of you cross over into Victoria and it's, it's, it's not awesome. So um, we, we, we're determined to, to change that. So we're gonna start by uh, improving some access around Mildura. Um, for those that fish Buffalo and, and Lanakuri, we've, we've um, you know, improved you know, the stability and some works around the main ramp at Buffalo, some, some beaching there. Um, we are about to design and do some work at Marshalls Ridge. Um, so it's basically improving the ramp access and also, again, really focusing on better car trailer parking um, and doing some reinforcement work to the foreshore there. And with Lanakuri, we're looking at relocating the ramp. Um, it becomes problematic there with swimmers, so we're looking at moving it a little bit away from the swimmers, separating the activities there, and we'll have a really great facility at Lanakuri once that one kicks off. I reckon that's, that's all I've got in terms of um, just giving you a bit of a, a, a quick overview of some of the projects, some of the 210 projects that we've got going. Um, I'm not too sure, Chris, if we're taking questions now or we, later on. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, and, and if anybody has any, anything else that they'd like to raise with us, we do have, if you go via you know, the Better Boating Victoria website, there's, uh, there's access there to be able to reach out to us and, and answer some questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. It must be uh, really enjoyable coming to work every day knowing you just got tens of millions of dollars to spend on uh, projects that improve recreational fishing and boating for the Victorian community. That sounds like some, a job that I'd really like to have, actually. Um, I'd like to invite our next uh, guest speakers up to talk to you about Macquarie, Macquarie Perch Revival. Um, Adele and Shay will both be speaking about something they're really incredibly passionate about, and they've done some incredible work to bring to fruition, the revival and recovery of Macquarie Perch. Adele will provide an overview of the work that the team are doing at Snobs, building towards captive breeding of Macquarie Perch for population recovery and sustainable fisheries. And Shay will share the journey that Macquarie Perch are taking post the black summer bushfires that took place a few years ago and talk about the outcomes that are being delivered under the bushfire recovery program. But first, a little bit of an intro about them both. Adele is a native fish production supervisor at Snobs Creek and has a ton of experience in marine and freshwater culture of fish, crustaceans and macro algae for research and industry development. Adele it has a strong passion for sustainability and is keenly applying her skills to the threatened species conservation. Adele is directly involved in the VFA's Macquarie Perch breeding program and facilitates hatchery rearing of those iconic fish. Whilst WERF leader, Women in Recreational Fishing, for those of you who aren't familiar with the acronyms that we use within government, Shea Bloom is a prominent face in the fishing industry. 
She's actively involved in many clubs and committees, all with the same desire and outcomes to maintain, improve and, project, and protect the future fishing for generations to come. Residing in the Upper Murray region, Shay is very passionate in bushfire recovery projects, working as a local area recovery officer at the Tawong Shire in in, and focusing on conservation of native and threatened fish species. She's a wife and mother to two young boys and when she's not spending time on the water with her family, then you'll find her out chasing marlin. Welcome. Adele and Shay. Saves me from having to introduce myself, um, but obviously I'm Adele, and I'll be talking to you about what the team at Snobs Creek have been doing um, in the work working towards revival of Macquarie Perch. And I don't. Can I click? <gasps> Maybe. Yes. Okay. So I'll just quickly go over what we're doing. Um, so, the team are aiming to increase hatchery production of Macquarie, Macquarie perch um, with a focus on returning our broodstock to the wild and therefore increasing our stocking of juveniles um, through the increased hatchery production, but we're also focusing on really protecting those wild and vulnerable populations. Um, so we want to put back those broodstock in really good condition after we've collected them. Um, now how we're doing this? Um, firstly, we're expanding the expertise of our technical staff. So I know especially for myself, I've been with the VFA since early 2020 and I'd never seen a Macquarie perch <laughs> before then. Um, and a lot of our staff similarly have started with us over the last 12 months to two years. So for us, it's been a really steep learning curve, um, but we're feeling really confident that um, we've got the expertise that we need to move forward in this space. Um, we're also increasing our hatchery capacity, so increased production means we need more room um, within our existing building in order to hold these fish um, and look after them during those really sensitive early life stages. Um, and ultimately, we're retaining fingerlings for the future, which I'll come back and touch on later, um, uh, which will be part of the captive breeding program that um, Travis mentioned earlier. So I'll just quickly run through what we do at Snobs Creek at the moment. Um, these are our beautiful broodfish, which we collect um, from the wild with the help of ARI and DELP. Um, so they come back to the hatchery in, in really good condition. Um, so we've made a few changes to how we collect those fish and how they travel back to snobs, which I think Shay's going to touch on as well. Oh, <laughs> um, we then, we manually spawn those fish. So it's a really um, a, a controlled environment where we can monitor the health and condition of those fish. We can manage our spawnings, which helps us with genetics. Um, we then incubate those eggs. Um, there were some pictures of incubators on the previous slide. And watch the larvae develop in the hatchery until they're ready to go out into the earthen ponds that Anthony was describing earlier. Um, they grow out into fingerlings, which are then ready for stocking. So this year, we've obviously, we've doubled on our production from last year. So we went from around 60,000 fish stocked to 145,000. Um, so we've, we've well more than doubled it this year. Um, and that's thanks to that increased capacity and having some really well-trained technical staff on site. So once this production cycle's complete, our brood fish oops, go back to the wild. Um, we retain a really small portion of those. So around 5% of those fish will hold on to for contingency. So let's say there's a really devastating bushfire again this coming summer and, and it's not practical or sensible for us to go and collect those fish from the wild we've got a contingency stock on site that have been conditioned in a hatchery environment. Um, so we'll still be able to carry on with our breeding and hopefully stock some um, once that event has passed. And then all our babies will go out into waterways, as I said, except for the few that will retain for the future. So what we're working towards is this captive breeding cycle. So we've definitely not achieved this yet, but we're uh, moving forward full steam ahead. So going forward, what we hope this will look like is broodfish on site, conditioned up from previous years, with some wild input. 
So that's really important for our genetics because um, we don't want to fully domesticate this species because obviously our intention is conservation at this stage, working with a threatened species. Um, we'll then again induce those fish on site, manually spawn. We've had really good success um, with those methods, grow the fish out, everything that we know in that process um, we're pretty confident with and that will lead to increased stocking back into the wild, which will not only rehabilitate those threatened and sensitive species um, populations like Dartmouth and Yarra, but also allow us to create new fisheries for the future. Um, so we've still got a few pieces of the puzzle that we need to solve. Um, and moving forward, there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes in terms of um, seeking funding, investment, and working together across um, a lot of Victorian and Australian stakeholder groups um, to answer a lot of the um, unanswered questions about Macquarie perch, um, which will help us close this cycle in the future. So watch this space. Thank you. That's pretty cool. Um, thank you, welcome everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land, the Yorta Yorta people, uh, past, present and emerging. Um, thanks to the VFA for inviting me here to speak, um, specifically JD, Taylor and Michelle, who unfortunately all couldn't be here today. Um, but I'm here to speak on the revival of Macquarie perch in bushfire affected areas. I'd better start my presentation. That's me. Um, I'm a wreck fisher. Um, as the introduction said before, I'm from northeast Victoria, a little place called Coryong, which um, is otherwise known to some as God's country. Um, mother and wife to two little legends, Riley and Moose, who are here, um, and my husband, Adam. So we love just being out on the water any chance we can. Fresh, salt, doesn't matter. We'll fish anywhere. So um, I'm just going to go through um, initially how did it happen, um, who was involved in the project, what did it look like, um, and looking back at us now. So in 2019, um, 2020, uh, the bushfires was really devastating to the Upper Murray. Um, so it burned approximately 1.5 million hectares um, in border New South Wales and Victoria. On January the 20th, 2020, um, there was a massive rain event which, as you can see here, um, killed a lot of fish, um, which was really devastating to our area especially because, you know, as rec fish shows and as a mum to two kids who takes their kids out to these stocking events, it was to see fish decimated, it was not great. But, yeah, we had um, panicked phone calls then from community, um, community members, farmers, people that were just concerned about our native fish, that they were going belly up. So I called anyone who was in my phone, anyone that had listened to me and said, we need help and we need it now. Um, I can't explain how humbled that we are um, for the help that we got on the ground um, post bushfires. So Andrew Briggs from NECMA assured me to let Mother Nature do her thing, but of course we were sceptical um, from looking at images like this. Um, the first slide up on the left-hand side is pretty self-explanatory. Um, so this was taken um, by myself. I was um, at the fires. Uh, and that was up at Walwa. Um, so you can see, I'm not sure if you can see up in that photo, but there's tiny little dotted um, lights up there. They're actually emergency service vehicles, so you can actually see how widespread that fire was. That fire front was probably about 10 kilometres. Um, yeah, and it took about six hours, uh, give or take, to travel about 50k. So it was, there wasn't much stopping it. Um, bottom left, as you can see, the riverbank, burnt trees, it was just sludge, tar, it was pretty revolting. Um, the photo in the middle there uh, is all the um, debris and everything just all stocked up in the um, creek, in the, uh, specifically to the Kudjawal Creek. Um, so the army initially came in um, to pull that debris out and help the creek flow again. 
photo on the right, as you can see, that's what we found. Um, when we went out, uh, my brother-in-law and my two boys, we went out um, after the rain event had happened, trying to find any fish alive that we could. Um, and as you can see on this fish here, that's what the water was like in the Kaji Creek after the rain. So Riley, my eldest son, looked up at me and said, Mum, this is the saddest, most devastating thing I've ever seen. And I think you'd all agree that he was right. So. From then to now. So this is a comparison photo that I took. So on the left-hand side was about March 2020. So you can see how choked up it is with debris and sludge and horrible, horrible water. Um, the photo on the right was taken, uh, I think it was December 2020, I took that photo. And that photo in the middle um, is my little man, Moose. Um, so he caught that fish out of that hole. We were thinking there's going to be no fish <laughs> left in here at all. But we were pretty damn excited when we caught that fish and let him swim for another day. So who was involved? Um, we had community group, we had individual um, community members, um, we had schools, we had um, government groups, so local, state and federal support um, on this project. So the VFA were the grant recipients um, of the grant um, and the partners included women in recreational fishing, uh, the Corriong Angling Club, Ovens Land Care Network, uh, Upper Murray Land Care Network, Tungarong Land and Water Council um, and DELP. So we were successful in securing a $181,000 uh, land care grant um, to recover the Macquarie Perch in the Upper Murray, specific to yeah, North East. Um, we've planted um, trees along the riverbanks to help revegetate. Um, that's something as bushfire-led recovery is really exciting for our area um, because it's something that people can see happen at the time. There's, I work in recovery and it's a long process, um, especially because we've been smashed by COVID, as everyone would know. It's been a very, very slow process. So having people, community members, um, who have been traumatised by such an event is fantastic to have them on the ground. So we had mums, dads, grandmas, grandpas, um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So um, we were able to release 15,000 fish into the Kudjawal Creek, uh, the Buffalo and the King. Um, yeah, so it's a much needed boost to Macquarie Perch. So the journey. Um, as Adele touched on before, these little these broodstock here, um, so they were flown by a chopper from Dartmouth um, with the help of ARI to get those broodstock out. Um, and you can see where they've been stocked along the Kudjuwa, the Buffalo and the King River. Um, Steve, I don't think there's a man in Australia that loves Macquarie Perch more than that man. So, um, what else do I have? We're pretty excited to have Macquarie Perch back in the Kudji Creek. It's been, um, we were talking to some older chaps in Kudjiwa and they said that they've guesstimated that there hasn't been Macquarie Perch in the Kudjiwa Creek for about 100 years. So to have that in the Upper Murray is pretty damn excited. So I'd like to thank everyone involved for making this dream become a reality. Um, and as a rec fisher on the ground, it's very humbling to be involved in such an amazing project. So thank you. I thank you, Shay, and thank you, Adele. That was a fantastic presentation to hear from you. Just out of curiosity, can you put your hand up if you've ever caught an estuary perch? 
Macquarie Perch, sorry. Oh, that's good, that's about 45% of you. Well done. Our next guest speaker this morning is Dr. Corey Green. Before I introduce Corey, and it looks as though Corey's written an introduction for himself here, which is uh, quite long, we might be narrowing that down a little bit, Corey. Just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for those who've traveled from far distances, from Bairnsdale, from Lakes Entrance, from other parts of the state. I'd also like to thank some of our colleagues from New South Wales Fisheries who are here today. Uh, would you mind putting your hand up if you're from New South Wales Fisheries? Excellent. We've been writing to New South Wales Fisheries looking to have licence reciprocation on uh, the Murray River and Lake Malwalla. So if anybody uh, just saw the gentleman over there put his hand up in the uh, morning tea break after you've had something to eat and you're wanting to wander around the Trade Centre area, you might stop past and just uh, mention that. That would be a really good outcome. We've, Victoria is currently letting New South Wales recreational fishing licence holders fish in Lake Hume for free or using their New South Wales licence. It would be terrific if we'd be able to reciprocate that in Lake Mulwalla first and then later on the Murray River. So Corey, Dr Corey Green, please come on up. Uh, Corey's going to talk to us about a, a recent study that he's just commenced on Murray Cod movements within the Upper, Gob Upper Goulburn River, which aims to unlock some of the um, information in regards to habitat preference and activity of this great fishery. Uh, Corey's been a scientist for a long period of time. He's had 75, or he's written 75 peer-reviewed papers in regards to uh, different species throughout Victoria. Over to you, Doctor. Thanks, Chris, and welcome everybody to this great conference. Um, I've been a recreational fisher all my life. I've really enjoyed the wonders that it, that it brought me and the experiences that it's brought me. Uh, I've been touring all around uh, Victoria, New South Wales, all around Australia fishing. One of these things that wanted me to learn more about fishing is to get into the science of it. I love the science. I want to really try to get as much out of the science so basically I could catch more fish. Well, it hasn't really worked out that way, but I still love all the science. Predominantly, I'm a, a saltwater science, uh, scientist. But when I got into, when I've been asked to do some freshwater research, I jumped in the, I jumped at that opportunity, and to do something on Murray cod, it's one of these things that, one of these species that I haven't had a lot of experience in. So what I've learnt has just been amazing from the, the recreational fishers I've been speaking to just recently. So this presentation is is on tracking uh, Murray cod in the Upper Goulburn River from Jamison and Kevington and beyond, if you know that region. It's such a magical place of the world. Okay, so it's no, no surprise that Lake Hilden is just a, a mecca of, of cod fishing. Uh, it's probably one of Australia's best known cod, cod fisheries. You know, about three million fish have been stocked over there in the, last, uh, in the last 30 years and it's been gaining more and more of a reputation to have you know, massive, big 20 kilo plus, metre plus fish. It's highly variable in its habitat. You probably know that it's, you know, it can be very, very deep, but there's also large... Uh, tributaries and the water flowing into it. So there's variable habitat with you know, different temperatures and depths and river currents and all this sort of thing that's happening. Food availability, different species of different areas. So what we wanted to do is try to get a bit of a feel and an understanding on one area of Lake Yildon uh, and that's the Jamison region. Uh, such a beautiful area and I hadn't been in there uh, until only a couple of months ago and I was astounded on its, about its beauty. So that's it down there, it might be a little bit hard to see uh, on the map there where it is in context to Lake Yildon but that's it down in that region. So it's, a, it's quite a large arm of the Goulburn, Upper Goulburn Murray, uh, sorry, Upper Goulburn part of Yildon uh, and it extends and extends, you know, Probably around 30 kilometres is sort of the research area that, I'll, that we'll be looking at. So the aim of the study is to gain an understanding of the movement, to track their movement. But it's this, and that's the movement in terms of spatial scale. So that's the distance of where they're travelling. Yeah, you know, where are they going? But also when are they going? You know, are they going up in winter? Are they going up in the river in summer? Are they utilising more of the lake in different uh, times of the year as well? What sort of depth preference they want? 
you know, do they choose deeper waters over particular times of year or particular seasons or even during day and night? And looking at that temperature preference as well. What sort of range do they, uh, do they like the most? Do they prefer the most? What sort of temperature range do they feed the most? You know, all these sorts of things, we can start building a bigger picture of what Murray Cod mean in this system. Acceleration is another thing as well. We've got some special tags uh, that, that measures the speed of the, of the fish or how active they are. And we might tie that up with all sorts of data. It might be that they, they switch on and start feeding at three o'clock in the morning or 6 a.m. So it gives back to the fisher all this information about some of the best times that there is to catch fish. And then we can combine this all with temperature data, environmental data, river flow data, you know, pressure systems, looking at and make a really big massive database. We can start teasing out all this information. And it's about finding out the when, the where, the how, and the why that these fish are doing what they do at certain times of the year. And it's all this sort of science thing that's, that we use to underpin most of our management decisions at the VFA. You know, without the, without the science, that it's hard to, to base our management decisions on. All right, so we've got, we've got these tags. We've got about 20 tags. This is a little tag here. You've got it in my finger there. This one measures temperature and depth, this one. But there's temperature and acceleration, sorry, depth and acceleration tags as well. So the battery on these lasts about two years. We've also got these acoustic listening stations. This is the station here. So when I put a tag inside a fish and that tag swims past one of these listening stations that's positioned in the water, it downloads all the information captured from the tag onto the receiver. So it's just listening, this is listening, and it captures all that information, downloads all that information inside. Then I can go along at periods of time, download the information from this onto the computer to know exactly where that fish has been, what it's been doing, what temperature it wants, what sort of activity it's had. So all, and I'll be doing that for 20, 20 or so uh, animals. So the receiver of this is, uh, it's around 300 metre radius, so it listens in 300 metre radius for the tags and strategically positioned, not only in the upper Goulburn part of, of, uh, of the river, um, but in the Goulburn arm of Lake Eildon as well. So as I mentioned, it, it, it records the tag number, the date and time, and stored all that information on here. So this will last about, um, I don't know, about 13 months or something, and the tags will last about two years, up to two years. And these are some of the locations that we'll be, ta that we'll, we'll be looking at. So we've got the Halqua uh, arm here, and here's our Goulburn River arm. Uh, so we'll have these positions, uh, receivers, listening stations here and here. Then the water starts getting quite shallow through Jamison and all the way to Kevington. And we'll be able to see these fish, if, they, if, if and what they're doing, is moving up and down. But this is also a bit of a gate. It's a bit of a window, so we can measure to see whether these fish down in here are moving out into the greater lake and then back in again over different periods of season. So we're getting that holistic approach of... of what they're actually doing, what this fishery is. So there's two phases of, of the tagging that, we, that we've done. The last one's only just finished. We came back from uh, Eildon on, on Thursday. And that was using uh, angler engagement, uh, getting anglers out there. We got bait fishermen and um, lure casters, all fishing that arm. They were bringing fish to me where I'd administer uh, the tag. So this is just some of the imagery of the, of the tag that we've got here. So they, we catch the fish, we put them in a, in a bucket with, with some um, anaesthetic in there to really calm them down. I perform a little bit of the surgery and then uh, we get, recover the fish in the water to, to release them there. So here's, here's just a bit of capture, of, a bit of footage of the, of the release. So really big fish coming through. So, it recovered quite well and it was quite happy to swim away there. All 
All right, so as mentioned, I only got back on, on Thursday uh, to do this part of it. Um, and there was eight Murray Cod that were, were caught in, in two, two and a half days or so. And, and looking by the lengths underneath there, you know, fish up to 104 centimetres, which is you know, very, very large. We're talking you know, big animals. And we've, if we've put in seven receivers uh, of the listening stations up and down the river as well. The second phase of it will start uh, not in two weeks' time, that, and we'll be involving scientists from Arthur Ryler Institute as well uh, to do electrofishing. We'll also do some um, um, fishing of traditional uh, recreational methods too. So that's that's happening very very soon, and then we'll be able to tag all of these, all of the animals, get all the tagging done, and have all the listening stations in in as well, so we can start collecting all the data. It's a very passive way of collecting, collecting data because it, once it's in there, the fish just do all the things that they do and we'll have the receivers all listening and doing all the things that it does. Uh, so where to from here? We'll collect the tagging data and receiving um, the receiver, oh, we'll complete the tagging and receiver deployment, uh, monitor the receivers every six months, get all that data, start doing some, some quick summaries and provide regular updates as well on both our social media pages and our and our website. It's one thing that we've got. It's one thing that really benefit the, this project is the collaborative nature of it. As mentioned before, I'm I'm one of the the scientists down the, of uh, marine basically, and for me to come in and do some Murray cod work a little bit out of my depth, but that's okay because there's. We've got a whole team of people in, in the freshwater science, freshwater management, um, other institutions like uh, ARI, and as well as the community engagement, it's <coughs> me. community engagement as well, where we can pull all these information resources together. It's not going to be one person that, look, that looks and has expert <coughs> expert summaries of these of this information. It'll be a combination of everybody. So here we have John Five here. He's fishing. Uh, he's just got, got a fish down in here. He donated his fish to science. John's over there in the audience. We successfully tagged that fish in only, in only a few, few minutes. It recovered quite well. And John gives a little tap on the nose to say thank you very much and thanks for your contribution to science. And off it goes swimming. So it's out there now collecting all the data as we speak. And I think... We'll leave it at that, but I think we're doing questions at a later stage. Is that right, Chris? Yep. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Corey. Really interesting um, and flexible approach that you're taking from your area of expertise being marine fisheries and going and doing some freshwater research. Um, really appreciate that. Our next uh, speaker is Greg Sharp from the Victorian Fisheries Authority and education and enforcement is really important for the future sustainability of our fisheries. Greg started working with fisheries and wildlife back in 1984 and studying native fish in Shepparton. He's worked within the compliance team since 1990, stationed in Shepparton, Benalla and Wodonga and was really passionate about the education side of uh, things as well as the enforcement side of things. Thanks Greg. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I started in 1984, which actually was right here in Shepparton. I started in uh, fisheries research, um, studying native fish north of the divide. And so I got a really good grounding and understanding of native fish from a research perspective. I did that for about five years. And then uh, I travelled overseas for a year. And while travelling overseas, I pretty much just went fishing. So I managed to go um, chasing Arctic grayling in Alaska, uh, salmon in uh, Canada, trout in Scotland, um, tiger fish in Africa. So I managed to travel all around the world catching all these great fish. But I can tell you right now that um, just here in Shepherd and on your doorstep, catching a Murray cod on the surface is equal to any of those experiences I had. So I think we're really fortunate to have such an iconic species that um, you know, is a world-class fishery and we've got it here and it's only going to get better. Uh, next slide. Okay, 
Uh, Trav, I know you've got a good voice. Rendition? No, Johnny Cash? No, all right. Okay, so uh, across the northern region where we've got our fisheries offices based, uh, we're constantly moving, we're constantly travelling around by boat, by car. You know, it's, it's one of those things we just don't stop. Uh, next slide, please. And so far, since the start of the financial year, so about eight months, uh, rough figures, we've done about 160,000 Ks, nearly 6,000 uh, anglers inspected, um, 300 odd offences with a compliance rate of roughly 94%. Now, just bearing in mind that compliance rate of 94%, that's actually taking into account a variety of offences, not just Murray Cod. So that actually also takes into account, you know, if we've um, someone's got too many crayfish, undersized golden perch, etc. And so the compliance rate, if you actually break it down for Murray Cod, is actually more like 97 to 98 per cent. So that means only about three, two to three percent of people actually offend against their Murray, Murray Cod fishery. Uh, and the reason for that is because everyone loves Murray Cod. In fact. Uh, a lot of the time when we're doing a patrol, I have to actually encourage people to keep the cod to eat. I tell them, you know, look, you actually can keep it. You can eat them, they're a great fish to eat. Um, but it's just the culture now we've developed that people catch cod, and whether they're oversized or undersized or you know, even size, they'll let them go because they've got such a great um, you know, status within the uh, community. And next slide, please. So to give some context to those statistics, there's the state of Victoria and uh, as you can see we've got six stations and at each location we have two staff. So we're scattered across the northern area, so there's two staff at each of those locations and we're covering lots of kilometres. Um, as I mentioned, you know, 160,000 odd kilometres, you know, that's just in eight months. Uh, next slide please. So those uh, stations each cover a, a multitude of waters, just to give you an idea of some of the waters that we do cover across the northern region. Uh, we've got a river system to the west of, uh, also the northwest of the state is sort of the Bendigo Swan Hill patch. So they're covering places like uh, the Lindsay River, Mullaroo, Walpola Creeks, you know, to the west of Mildura, uh, the Gumbau Creek, yeah, the Lydon, the Kankaran, um, Epilock, Campaspe. And then you head down to the western part of the state towards Horsham, where we've got two staff. Uh, you've got, obviously, Taylors, as uh, you know, you see in the media, we call it Codlins now, or, um, and Lake Charlie Grant. And for Adele, just a little bit of background, Lake Charlie Grant was where we first um, started breeding our Murray Cod back, yeah, before I started, back in the late 70s. Uh, and it's one of the sort of, it's the, it's where we first learn about how to breed Murray Cod and, you know, it's taken a long time, but you look at where we are today, which, you know, gives us some hope with our Macquarie Perch that uh, in the future our Macquarie Perch will be as successful as a Murray Cod. It just might take some time. And then you come down to the Goulburn system where we've got staff at uh, Tatura, uh, Snobs Creek, and they're looking after, you know, our popular waters, Nilakuti, Nagambi, where, you know, we recently had go fish. Uh, the Goulburn River system, the Broken River, and obviously um, Lake Eildon itself. Uh, Lake Eildon, a fantastic Murray Cod fishery that's just been getting better and, uh, and better. Um, interestingly, the photo at the top right-hand corner is from... Um, that's actually from Lake Eildon just recently uh, as a result of a 13 fish uh, call. So 13 fish is where the public can ring up if there's a fisheries offence. And uh, the officer there, Officer Strongman, who's based at uh, Snobs Creek, received a tip that uh, there were some people acting sus suspiciously um, with a freshly graded, uh, painted green boat. That's pretty much all he had to go on in a general locality. Um, he's managed to track it down just as they were leaving and uh, upon the inspection, he's uh, pulled up an oversized cod as well as some uh, excess golden perch. So you know, a really good result that wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have got without that sort of 13 fish help from the public. Uh, the photo below, that's actually a, a sort of different circumstance. That one actually relates to um, a whole lot of illegal gear that we came or that we found in a fella's uh, storage facility at his property. But we actually got that information through some surveillance cameras that we had set up some illegal gear down along the ovens below Wangaratta. 
We managed to get a registration from it and then from that track it down to the, uh, to the owner and uh, we're able to obviously retrieve a whole lot of illegal gear from his shed which can't be put to use. Uh, and then finally in the, in the northeast of the state, uh, in Wodonga where I am, um, we've got those rivers there, you know, the Ovens, King, Kiwa, Mitter, uh, Hume. And interestingly, um, the Ovens River has long been a, a great spot for Murray Cod, but it's only since well, I've been you know, in Wodonga for uh, 20 odd years, um, and since we've had the really extensive uh, breeding program and fish release program, that places like the King River, the Kiwa, Mida, Buffalo, and Lake Hume, for example, have really come on. You know, 20 years ago, you'd be flat out catching a cod there. Now, any day of the week, you can go out and catch Murray cod in those waters, which have been, you know, revived as a result of the stocking program. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Which, uh, as I touched on a moment ago about the illegal fishing, um, it, it's really beneficial uh, to us as fisheries officers to receive information from the public. Uh, as I said, we've only got 12 staff scattered across northern Victoria. We know the patch pretty well, but we really rely on the public support and fishermen's input, anglers' input. Uh, so if you do actually come across any illegal fishing, you can ring our 13 fish number, which we actually have staffed 24-7, uh, 133474. So information, you know, what the person's doing, is there illegal gear, you know, that type of information, where they are, the number of people, registrations obviously are fantastic. Um, and then you can ring up 13 fish. Something else you can consider doing, which is really, really helpful, is to actually uh, get your phone out and take a screenshot of where you are. And that'll um, give us an indication of where the actual gear is, or alternatively, even better, if you could open up your map, Google Maps and actually just put a pin drop of where the location of the offence is occurring, and then when you ring 13 fish, you can actually send that to us, because um, you'll be put in direct contact with the fisheries officer, and uh, you can actually send that information to us. And it just cuts down the amount of dead time we've got trying to find the gear. So often with illegal gear, it's actually hidden under the water, uh, and if you can put a pin drop on that bend where the gear is, it gives us a better chance of finding it and obviously getting it out of the water and catching the uh, offenders. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, get, getting to the here and now. Uh, one of the benefits of being a fisheries officer is that you're constantly talking to fishermen and you get to know where the fish are and where the fish are biting, what they're catching them on. Uh, and just this week I thought, well, I'm going to come to the conference I'll let everyone give, give everyone the good oil and where they're going at the moment. So I rang my colleagues in the northern area. And uh, so if you think of going cod fishing in the next week or so, this is where they're actually biting right at the moment. So Gunny Creek uh, or Gumbau Creek up um, near Kahuna, they're catching plenty of cod on bait. Taylor's Lake bait. Cancurran, interestingly, they're catching lots of yellow belly at the moment. And as a bycatch, they're getting a lot of cod just on the small hard bodies. Um, yeah, as you can see, lots of places across the state. Um, if you haven't got a boat, Lake Nilakuti at the Sandy Creek Arm, it's about halfway up the Midland Highway. It's a good spot just from the bank, walking, casting lures. Uh, and obviously Myrtleford uh, down at Tarawindji is a great spot if you've got a kayak, if you're interested in kayak fishing. Uh, and for those who like to cast the big swim baits, uh, the big heavy rods and swim baits, um, the area we call the Everglades down below Bundalong uh, is producing a lot of big cod. And often I get asked, and fisheries officers get asked, you know, what are they biting on? What are, they, what are you catching the fish on? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Yep, and they say, what do they eat? And my answer is anything they like. Uh, except as you can see that last one on the right, I think he tried to bite off more he can chew. And uh, that was a 1.1 metre cod that tried to uh, engulf a carp and unfortunately died in the process. But uh, yeah, in terms of what you want to use for fishing for cod, it doesn't matter. They're, um, yeah, they'll eat anything. Anyway, that's all my time today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sharpie.
It's, uh, it's fantastic when we have fisheries officers of the caliber of Gus, Anthony, Sharpie and Murray who are out there every day, not just with an intent to bust people, but actually out there to meet with recreational fishers, be informative, find out where the fish are biting for themselves, obviously all in the best interest of uh, improving recreational fishing. Just wanted a quick uh, reminder that if at all you have any questions throughout the day, please just scan the QR code on your table and you can submit those through to us. Um, one of the benefits of having that particular system is as you think about the question during the presentation, you can whip up, log on to the, uh, the app there, submit the question, and we'll have that ready to fire off to our respective panel members a bit later on today. Uh, next up, we have Jason Lesky, senior scientist at the Arthur Ryler Institute, who's gonna talk to us about epiloc cod recruitment. Uh, recreational anglers have proposed the lifting of the Murray cod closed season in other waters, such as Lake Epilock. So to support such a change, an assessment is required at Lake Epilock to understand the level of natural recruitment of Murray Cod. This project is designed to inform management about the potential for opening Lake Epilock all year round as a Murray Cod fishery, which is really exciting. Jason. For those of you who are hungry, morning tea will be served immediately after Jason's presentation. All right, thanks everyone for coming. Um, thanks to VFA for the invite. Um, we'll see how we go. As introduced, this project was more about um, doing some background into see if Lake Kepler could be opened up as a fishery. This is similar to Eildon has in the previously. Um, I'll just race through some of these because I know it's getting close to morning tea, so I won't talk about that. You'll see those slides coming up in a minute. Um, so VFA, as you know, have opened up Murray Cod into Lake Eildon and it's been a very huge success and largely based on their Eildon Millions program, largely based on stocking. Um, so there's been the opportunity now to invest whether we can do this to other lakes within Victoria. Um, so one of these is to assess Lake, Lake Epilock and so what do you need? You need to know some more background about the population of Epilock and in particular to see if there's any natural recruitment in that lake. So how do we do that? Well, when we first thought about this project, thought the easiest way is all the, all the hatcheries at the moment are currently collecting genetic samples, little fin clips from their brood stock, the ones they brood from. From that, all the finglings get released you'll have a genetic marker and so if you catch that fish you just need to take a clip on it and you can trace it back to the hatchery. Unfortunately the MDV fish program that, that does that um, isn't up and running as yet and the, the benefit of that is that when you catch the fish you take a little clip and it's you measure the length and it's released back at site you know, alive without a problem. But as I said it's not running yet so that sort of crossed um, that, that out. And as cod had been stocked into Epilock previous to this survey, we don't know what was stocked and what wasn't because we haven't got that genetics background. Now we couldn't sort of do a genetic study. And if we had, had the access to do a genetic study, we could look at a range of fish from you know, your five centimetres up to, up to a metre and work out you know, what was natural recruitment historically. But we can't do that. So the next method was to look at odorless microchemistry. And I'll give you a bit more background about odorless microchemistry. It's actually looking at the ear bone of the fish. So as a fish grows, it takes into the chemicals from the water, the micro elements from the water, and they're laid down on the bone in proportion to what's in the water. So, for example, we've had some fish in tributaries of the Goulburn River. These are small fish that only grow this big. And we could tell that they were out of this tributary compared to this tributary in the Goulburn River based on that odorless microchemistry. So each river's different based on the underlying geology of the river of what micro elements are in the water. So we thought, beauty, well, we'll try this one. One of the disbenefits of this is you actually got to kill the fish to get the ear bone out. We thought we can wear that if, if we're going to stock a heap more and get the fishery created. Um, Bit hard to see here, but on, but on, on the left, figure A, is uh, odolith. 
and you can see the, the rings in there, and, and that's age ring, so you can age it. But also, if you took a core sample from the very middle of that otolith, or the, on the top of that screen there, and then did a laser ablation that's called right through to the edge, that's where you can trace back the microchemistry. So the figures B and C actually just show examples of, of the distance from the core, so right on the cores where it's been, just that was in a hatchery, and then on the one on the right, you can see it's been released into a river and the otolith chemistry changes. So we thought, OK, let's do this in Lake Epila. But believe it or not, the only river in all of Victoria that's similar to the, to the Murrumbidgee River where you get the hatcheries from is the Campaspe River, which the Epilogue sits on. So we couldn't do that. So we had to go, go find another alternative. So what we came up was doing a pretty intensive survey for juvenile Murray cod prior to the 22 stocking. So we know if we're getting any five, seven, eight centimetre fish they'll, or less, they'll be last year's breeding before BFA stock this year's 500,000 Murray cod. So we came up with if we have to do boat electrician for day and night and then use some netting methods as well. Now the reason we do night electrofishing for cod, as Trav said, mentioned earlier about his big fish that he catches consistently, he's caught four times now, comes out at night. Well, that actually starts from when a cod's very tiny. When an egg hatches, and it just gets to the swimming stage, those Murray cod will move away from the nest. During the day, they'll hide up in little bits of habitat. At night, they'll come up to the water column and feed and drift with the current, and drift downstream. When it comes back to daytime, They'll slowly work their way to the edges of the bank, get out of the current and hide up where no one can see them. The next night they come up and, and drift down. So the next part of that was we need to cover the whole lake but, but focus on the freshwater inputs. Now the reason why we want to fo focus on the freshwater inputs because that's where you're more likely to get natural recruitment. Murray cod survival of the eggs, larvae and small ones is much higher in flowing water. They do breed in dams and survive and they will breed in, in some rivers that have no flow. But all the research we've done and looking at the difference between flows, you have a much greater recruitment success, so that's the survival of eggs and larvae, in years where there's flowing water in the same river compared to years where there's none. Um, so that's why we thought we'd cover you know, the, 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 the flow of freshwater imports, and then we really want to cover the weir wall, and that's just based on previous research where, because of the complex habitat structure, you get more smaller, smaller native fish. And so while we did that, there was electrofishing day and night, there some bait traps and some fike nets that were set in the shallower water. And that's because the cod come out that night. So electrofishing is limited to two or three metres deep. Most of the lake's too deep, but because we're targeting those five centimetres, seven centimetre fish, and they're out in the shallows at night feeding. Yeah, that, that's why that method came up. And we have caught them previously in other lakes. So what did we find? Well, redfin were everywhere. There was just thousands of them. And I'm saying you can go along, and it's a bit hard to see, but the photo on the right, all those little white dots behind the electrofishing anodes, are small redfin. For the whole bottom half of the lake, Every time we turn the electrofisher on and press the button to put a current into the water, there'd be five to 50 to 60 redfin in, in an area like that. The whole bottom half of the lake. Didn't matter if you're on sand, silt, rock, good habitat or not. Once we got up to the, towards the top end of the lake, it wasn't as many, but then sometimes you come across where they're in true small redfin patterns in schools where you might have 50, you might have 500, you might have... 5,000 in the school, and we didn't worry about netting and canning all them. So that, that, that 10,000 fish, or 9,000 one, is, is an underestimate. Um, I'll just go through some other species we've got, not too, too exciting there, they're just the exotics, just some notes that somewhere at the top of the lake only, somewhere everywhere, like carp. Carp were mainly adults. Then some other small natives that we caught. What? To note here is the flat-headed gudgeon. It only grows, you know, seven centimetres. It's like that um, complex rocky habitat and trees, which is similar to your Murray cod and golden perch. So what do we find? Not many Murray cod and no small ones. Didn't really surprise us, but I'll go into that a bit more in detail. We've got quite a few golden perch 
but both of them were all from the complex habitat. And one of the main areas where that was from was um, the biggest number of fish for golden perch was on the weir wall. And I'll show you a photo of that weir wall later. Don't worry about this one too much. This, this is just looking at comparisons of research we've done in other lakes prior to this work to say that the methods work for catching small Murray cod. The main thing I want to say there is if you look at either from the wall or away from the wall, Lake Eplock had three to tenfold less Murray cod throughout the system than the other lakes that we surveyed. That's Taylor's Lake, Eildon, Lena Curry. But it also, we've done work on Neil Akuti where we've caught Murray cod away from the wall, young ones during the day that were likely recruitment rather than stocked. Um, so what's this mean when we compare this with other lakes dams across the Murray-Darling Basin and Victoria? Well, we know in lakes, Murray cod and golden perch recruitment has declined from when they were first built back in the 50s. Now, we know, as I said before, we know they can spawn in standing waters and larvae being collected within weir pools, but that flowing water enhances their survival. So lakes aren't a great place for Murray cod to successfully breed and, and succeed in that breeding. There's other work done by New South Wales, you know, in, in Copeland Dam. Most of the cod there is from stocked fish. And that, that can be said, you know, there's lots of literature out there that, can, that says that. And based on the 2014 study on the eel and millions, you know, it's the same thing. 99% of the fish collected in that study were stocked. Having said that, we know there's some still good fish that are natural in there, and Corey's going to investigate in a few weeks, as you saw in a previous talk. So, can it be turned into a year-round fishery? Well, I say, why not? There's no reason regarding the, the small natural Murray cod population that's in there. I'm sure if we targeted the larger Murray cod with nets and other, and other methods, we would have caught some bigger fish, and anglers are catching bigger fish. I'm not saying they're not there. I'm not saying there was no breeding there just based on this one week's work, but the level of recruitment is likely to be very low based on what we found, plus other evidence that, that's been shown. Um, but I would be aware that, um, you know, stocking large amounts of Murray cod might impact other species that are in the lake. Might be a good thing with the amount of small redfin in there at the moment. Um, and I'd say, just some notes if for BFA when they are stocking. Stocking is when the lake isn't riding and breeding, redfin breeding isn't prolific. Well, I know this is hard because often you're ordering your fish, you know, six months or a year out and you don't know what the season's going to do. But the men of redfin in there would just be smacking all those little ones. I didn't really go into that table before. There was a little native fish called the Australian smelt. That was very low numbers. That's a species that's normally up on the surface in schooling. All the other lakes that we served in the past would get larger numbers, and it wouldn't surprise me if they're low this year just based on the redfin predation on those. Yeah. Yep. And the other one is stocking areas with good habitat. Take your time to actually put these fish into areas that might be avoiding the redfin. So go, go up into the arms where there's a bit of flow um, and take, it, take to the areas. Like it's a bit hard to see there in the wall, but every lake around Victoria's got a wall that's got that really, really complex rocky habitat. And that's what the Murray cod like naturally, and, that, and that's where you find them a lot of the time, especially those small ones. Yeah. All right, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Well, that's it. Morning tea now, everybody. Um, it'll be delivered to your tables. Uh, there's obviously, we've set aside some time for after you've had something to eat and drink to have a bit of a wander around. Uh, I know most people in the room, but those of you who don't know me, it was a fairly uh, tongue-in-cheek comment before about engaging with uh, our colleagues from New South Wales Fisheries. We obviously work very closely with them on a range of different projects, and we'll continue to work with them in regards to license reciprocation. Thanks.
You need to get your tea and coffee from the three tea and coffee stations, but food will be delivered to your table. Is that right?